it's over here. This is the 6500 XT and this is the most bleeding edge technology. This card. Bleeding edge? Yes. <laughs> is it the card that gamers crave? It's got electrolytes. <laughs> This is the graphics card at the bottom of the 6000 series GPU stack from AMD, but it's the newest. But at the leading edge of technology, you're pulling my leg. No, really, it's actually true. This is six nanometers. This is TSMC six nanometer process. This is the, uh, the incubator, if you will, for what's coming with the next generation fabrication process. And that means absurdly high clocks out of the 6500 XT. Our Gigabyte OC model here, the Eagle, tops out at just over 2.8 gigahertz for the core clock speed. It's basically 2.8 gigahertz all the time. Boost, no boost, it doesn't care. Infinity Cache, that's what it's got. Full support for DirectX 12, and even a little bit of ray tracing acceleration, even though it's at the very bottom of the 6000 series stack, but it's also the newest in the 6000 series stack, at least at the time that I'm making this video. This is a build that is designed to be mass produced as inexpensively as possible. Just four PCI Express 4.0 lanes means a less complex PCB and fewer passive components are needed. So you use the full X16 slot, only four lanes. Doesn't that mean this card would suffer in a PCI Express 3.0 motherboard? Because not everybody's PCI Express 4. Uh, it turns out not really, but we'll see that in the benchmarks. I don't want to get too ahead of myself. You should also know that this card eschews hardware encoders. So for streaming, you're gonna be relying on the CPU or something else. Now, there's no encoder at all, but it does have hardware decoders for VP9, H.264, and H.265. That means there's no AV1 decoder. AV1 is sort of the new open source. There's just not, you know, it's, it'd be good if it supported AV1, but it doesn't. The silicon is very small, so. It does have a single six pin power connector. This board is sort of a peak power consumption of around 120 watts. AMD targets about 107 watts. So like I say, this is an OC model and this is four gigabytes. So if your game doesn't fit in four gigabytes of VRAM, probably not gonna have the best time. Well, I, I, just, uh, just a second there, four gigs is not necessarily the same as four gigs. Not everybody realizes that one of the cool things that, that PCI Express was supposed to bring to the table was that you know if you have a graphics card that doesn't have enough VRAM, the graphics card can just automatically get what it needs from system memory. The problem is the 6500, the interface, if you're running this in a PCI Express 3.0 system, you've only got PCI Express 3.0 by four. That's definitely a bottleneck when you're coming from main memory because main memory is very fast. And this will be the slowest component in the link. So it is critically important if you wanna maintain good performance that you configure your games so that all of your games run from the available VRAM on the card and you're very careful not to go over that limit. If you go over that limit, best case scenario, you're gonna have terrible performance. Worst case scenario, uh, the game's gonna crash and act weird. I ran into that with Fortnite. On one particular configuration, this wasn't a universal thing, so I think it was maybe a BIOS setting or something with a particular motherboard, I could actually get Fortnite to crash because I was trying to run Afterburner and Fortnite, and Fortnite was saying it was using about 3.8 gigs of VRAM but it kept crashing and having weird problems. Now, I didn't have that problem on another test system, so I just sort of chalk it up to the system. I just reconfigured it and, and tested it. Also tested on, on Alder Lake as well as a 5800X. Just move the CPU over to another motherboard, another Windows installation, fresh Windows installations all around. But hey, what are you gonna do? No problems. Whereas, you know, with the 480, this PCI Express 3.0 by 16 interface, it's a lot easier for this card to move things in and out of its VRAM from main memory. So that's kind of an advantage that the 480 has over the 6500 XT. Uh, that said, you know, this card is how old and it's still a perfectly viable card in this class. It's a little worse performing than the 6500 XT in its best case scenario, but uh, I have a feeling this card is not gonna be in use quite as long unless the global situation continues on for a lot longer. So four gigs of VRAM is not quite equal to four gigs of v VRAM when you are bottlenecked by that PCI Express interface. 
Of course, I don't really think it's fair to call it a bottleneck in the traditional sense because you really want to be able to run your game at you know medium or high settings. Fortnite will run at epic settings and use less than four gigs of VRAM. So I don't know what I was doing to cause that particular problem, but you're definitely gonna to wanna to make sure that whatever game you're running, you run it such that you don't exceed the four gig VRAM limit. And now back to our regularly scheduled ramblings. First up, the eSports titles. Did you know that it's possible to use more than four gigs of RAM in Fortnite? I mean, I was vaguely aware uh, up here in my ivory tower of, you know, lots and lots and lots of VRAM and the 6900 XT and, and, and other high-end GPUs, but it did really hit home. <laughs> I adjusted the graphics settings a little bit and it was fine. Yeah, it was more than fine, really, at, at over 100 frames per second in Fortnite to be just under that four gigabytes of VRAM. Now, Overwatch, Valorant, Apex Legends, all over 100 FPS on high or better settings. Only PUBG on DirectX 11 was sort of consistently below 100 FPS at around 79, 80 FPS, give or take, on our test map replay. Now, should you upgrade? I used an RX 480 to do comparisons, and also a 1650. Remember the 1650? The 1650 is quite a bit newer than the RX 480, but you know, you never know. You never know what you're working with. The RX 480, that's a five-year-old graphics card. Five plus years, but it was also priced at 199 for the four gig version. It's interesting. We'll talk about that in a bit. But what about AAA titles other than esports titles? Well, let's take a look. Borderlands 3 in DirectX 11 on high was about 60 FPS or about 25% faster than our RX 480. Cyberpunk 2077 was surprisingly good around 60 FPS mostly. There was a couple of scenarios where you'd get below 60 FPS, but that was on a 1080p medium. Far Cry 6 was about 75 FPS and several other AAA titles around 60 to 100 FPS depending on what you were doing. Even the Halo Infinite campaign was close to 60 FPS at 1080p on low settings. For the campaign, for whatever reason, medium or higher seemed to have VRAM problems. It crashed to desktop, at least when I was testing. Hopefully that'll be fixed by the time this video comes out. However, in multiplayer, medium was fine. Of course, the fix, well, Fidelity FX to the rescue. You can turn it on even when you're not supposed to, you know. Shadow of the Tomb Raider, with ray tracing on, even managed to 72 FPS on the medium preset. Now, our test system, it's a Ryzen 5800X with 32 gigs of memory on the 3600 XMP profile, and that was uh, in our ASRock Creator X570 board, which is, uh, you know, at the high end, it's overkill. You, didn't, you don't need to run X570. Smart access memory was on for all of this testing. Smart access memory didn't hurt us any at all. Now for titles like Far Cry 6, if you have a high refresh monitor, you might want better than 60 FPS. You might want, you know, 90-ish FPS. Well, okay, hey, Fidelity FX, FSR at DirectX 12 and the high preset, I could easily manage nearly 100 FPS in ultra quality mode and over 100 FPS in quality mode. Both of those presets for FSR, for my eye, are basically indistinguishable from native rendering. So turn it on. Why wouldn't you turn it on? I mean, it's especially the Ultra. If you got a display that can clock above 60 hertz, turn it on. You'd be surprised. It's gonna work pretty well for you and you'll get better than 60 FPS through your monitor. 1080p, again, now there are some compromises when you're this far down the graphics stack. There's not a lot of games I would really recommend for 1440p and only four PCIe lanes as I mentioned, but it turns out the four PCIe lanes things is not really much of a compromise as long as you're running this card at 1080p. Another compromise, it only has two outputs, a single DisplayPort 1.4 output as well as HDMI. So it cuts down on the number of components and that sort of thing. Also had some trouble with Linux drivers on this one, but I expect that that's gonna be sorted out pretty quickly. So if you're interested in Linux coverage for the 6500, be sure to check out the Linux channel. I think the reason is because this is new six nanometer technology not quite all the ducks are in a row yet. So, I don't know. <laughs> Mining performance is not great on this card either. and It's only got four gigs of VRAM. So I think, I mean, I don't know. I really don't know if these considerations for optimizing for mass production, minimizing the number of connectors, saving on passive components, and the whole mining thing is gonna ultimately mean that you have a reasonable chance of buying this card or others like it close to manufacturer recommended pricing. It is very strange times that we live in right now. Um, someday there might be a flood of 
relatively high-end GPUs on a secondary market that are perfectly usable once they're no longer valuable for other tasks. I don't know. I don't know how that's going to shake out. I don't know if this card at its price point is such that anybody would want to buy it for anything other than gaming. I'm trying to take it for a spin at $200, it doesn't seem like it would be a great value for anything other than gaming. But being able to game at 60 FPS plus, even in AAA titles, you know, all the latest titles, that, that, I mean, we've got Resident Evil and a whole bunch of other games that have, that have very recently come out, the run on this card, great at 1080p. So for gaming, at its MSRP, it seems like a good choice, especially if you have no GPU or you have something older and worse than an RX 480. AMD did their homework in some of the materials that they prepared for this. You know, they said 47% of gamers have, uh, you know, a 1650 or something worse than a 1650. And this handily beats uh, an NVIDIA 1650. And it, it handily beats even an RX 480. Uh, they compared to an RX 570. So, I mean, these are pretty old cards. If you had a flagship card that's even three or four years old, it's probably not much of an upgrade for you if you're, you know, you're really itching to move up. There's not really a lot out there that is even close to MSRP prices. So it's definitely a very weird situation. But I appreciate that AMD gave me a chance to look at this card early. It is a competent card for what it is. And it's really impressive that it's able to do that even in PCIe 3.0 lanes. Now, I didn't include it in the charts, but I did actually do additional testing on a PCIe 3.0 motherboard, an older Intel system, and the performance numbers were close to the same with the uh, Intel test system with this card running at PCIe 3.0. Um, there were a couple of games where it was maybe three or four FPS slower, but the greatest deviation was only about seven FPS slower, at about the 90 FPS range. So, I mean, you might see a tiny little bit of a bottleneck with PCI Express 3.0, but anecdotally, not really very much. You'd have to be, you know, right at the razor's edge in terms of having like the best CPU in the PCI Express 3.0 generation, but your mileage may vary a little bit there. I also like the fact that this is only a 1.8 slot card. It's not really much to it. it seems like it's pretty easy to manufacture. I really hope that translates into availability for gamers. I'm Wendell, this is Level 1. This has been a quick look at the Gigabyte Eagle RX 6500 XT 4GIG. I'm signing out, and you can find me in the Level 1 forums. Mm -hmm.